This episode contains strong language and may not be suitable for all listeners. Please be advised. Paolo Macchiarini was once considered among the most pioneering surgeons in the world. Surgeons in Sweden have carried out the world's first transplant of a synthetic organ. In what seems like the plot from a science fiction novel, researchers built a new windpipe. Until it all fell apart. The Italian surgeon involved, Paolo Macchiarini, has since been exposed as dishonest. The BBC reports Stockholm authorities are gathering information about the three operations conducted at Karolinska University Hospital to see if there are grounds for manslaughter charges. Over the last six episodes, we covered just how he came to convince doctors, patients, and journalists that he was changing medicine. He was advertised as sort of the savior of uh, the Karolinska. So very quickly, everybody knew who he was. And how he convinced one woman to fall for him. I just, I couldn't fight it anymore. I just wanted to be with him and I wanted to be wrapped in love. Of the eight documented tracheal implants that Paolo Macchiarini performed, only one patient is believed to be alive. And that patient had his implant removed. Paolo is now a disgraced surgeon. And so far he has evaded justice, but that might change. In September, 2020, Swedish prosecutors charged Paolo with aggravated assault in connection with the surgeries he performed at Karolinska. His trial is scheduled for 2022. One of the things that struck me is how he was able to pull it off, how he was able to just get away with it. Out of all the people we spoke with for this series, there's one person who had the most interaction with him, his former fiance, Benita Alexander. Today, I'm talking with her about what she went through and how Paolo kept his secrets and what her life has been like since Paolo was exposed. Thanks to ADT, our presenting sponsor. I enjoy true crime podcasts as much as the next person, but I think we've all experienced that moment when an episode hits a little too close to home and you end up having trouble sleeping. Well, you can rest easy knowing that 24-7 peace of mind is always near from the leaders of the home security category, ADT. Strategy Analytics 2020 called ADT the number one smart home security provider, and it's easy to see why. ADT has received the most burglar alarm events in the industry and helped save more lives than any other home security provider. They've also got top-of-the-line tech, including security camera technology that can detect the difference between a pet and a person to help reduce false alerts. With nine owned and operated call centers and more experience in the industry than anyone else, no matter what you want to protect, Nobody has more experience helping keep it safe than ADT. Help protect what matters most. Get all the latest security upgrades from the largest name in home security by visiting ADT.com today. ADT. Brilliantly safe. From Wondery, I'm Laura Beale, and this is a special interview episode of Dr. Death, Miracle Man. Benita Alexander is a longtime producer, director, and reporter. She's worked at NBC News, Discovery, and Oxygen. She's won two Emmys and an Edward R. Murrow Award. After she made the documentary A Leap of Faith about Paolo for NBC News, she later made her own documentary about what she'd been through with him called He Lied About Everything, which is probably the most fitting title for a documentary ever. Benita? Hi, Laura. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you. Thanks for talking to me today. What a story. Jeez. (laughs) Crazy, right? (laughs) It is nuts. And I was just listening to it. I wasn't even living it. So I I can't even imagine. I have to confess, when I was uh, listening to this story, though, part of me, in a way, was glad that it happened to you. Because if it wasn't for you... And it wasn't for the journalists in Sweden, like he might he might still be operating on people. I think you're absolutely right. And that I, it's horrifying. I mean, in that sense, this whole thing, I always say in some weird way, this makes sense to me that because I am a journalist and I, you know, I am determined and stubborn and 
I did have the tools to expose him and was able to do it. And somebody else might not have had the strength to do that. I know that. And in that sense, in a weird way, I'm too grateful that it happened to me and incredibly grateful that he, you know, bumped heads with the whistleblowers because it's very difficult, very, very difficult and painful to speak up. You know, one of the things that struck me as a difference from the previous stories I've told is they didn't go after the whistleblowers so hard. So, you know, I, I mean, we can, you know, torture ourselves with the yeah. with the what ifs, but um, but yeah, I mean, if it if it wouldn't happen to you, you know, I don't want to dwell on this point too much, but I'm like, I agree with you. Like, I'm in a warped way, kind of glad it did in retrospect. <laughs> you know, so. Well, thank, thank you. I wouldn't <laughs> I think wouldn't you know what I, I mean wouldn't want to go through it again. <laughs> I do. I really I really do and I really appreciate that. I would not want to live it again and I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but I do think and it's turned into this whole other sort of mission and, you know, purpose that I just I never expected. Um and and that also makes it make sense to me that if I can somehow help other women and help other people, then somehow this whole crazy mess makes sense. And when you say you've been contacted by women, women who've also been, you know, led down a path and 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 conned, and then found out that the person they thought they loved was someone else altogether. Yeah, these were women who've also been conned and betrayed by someone they loved who completely betrayed them. And the theme to all of these was this shame, this overriding sense of shame and embarrassment and not being able to talk to anybody about it as if all these women had a collective red letter on their backs or something. And I was so upset by that and so touched at the same time by the fact that they're thanking me and saying, you've made me feel less stupid. You've made me realize that it's okay, because if this could happen to you, obviously it can happen to anyone. But let's go back to who really does, you know, who really does deserve blame here. I mean, Paolo, number one. But after that, how complicit was Karolinska? In this in this whole thing, because I it you never really state that you know directly, but it's certainly clear. But I I'd just like to know your thoughts on how how much they really had to do with Paolo Maccarini's career and how much they were willfully ignorant about what was happening. It's funny. I was just having this conversation yesterday, actually, after listening to the third episode, because there there are things in there and in the first episode that I didn't know, and I'm I was absolutely appalled and horrified like what? by could you be could you be specific about oh that's that i mean and i i just can't get it out of my head and the two things about yashim that just i did not know that he did that initial surgery on her for i'm sorry it sounds like no fucking legitimate reason he goes in and cracks open her chest and does open surgery just because he wants to have a look and that that surgery was unnecessary and then it goes so catastrophically wrong. I didn't know that. And that just horrified me. I just, I mean, I gasped when I heard that story. Because right there, the whole thing could have been stopped. I mean, he's just, he's so reckless. And then that scene where the doctors are talking about how she, despite being so weak and barely can get out of bed, she puts on her best dress and gets all dressed up for Paolo. And he knows this and he doesn't even go in the room. That infuriated me hearing that, that imagining what she must have been feeling at that time and the blatant disregard for just basic humanity, the the just callous, careless, arrogant, thoughtless, I could use a million words, that, but that the it's just so blatant that he just doesn't care about his patients. What about Karolinska? Like, he, he couldn't have gotten away with it so, if without... No, except, yeah. So there's a sort of collective desire among all the people that were entangled with him, from institutions to scientists to doctors, to sweep things under the rug and look the other way and sort of pretend that things weren't happening. It was somebody like him walks into a room with so much charisma and charm and arrogance and and commands the room and walks the walk and talks the talk and seems to be exactly everything he tells you he is. People just don't question. They don't 
doubt. We suspend our doubts with people like that because we just, it seems impossible that somebody like that would lie. This and is it, very it happens much the over and over again. I mean, yes. you know, look at, yes. look at the other do- doctors who've, you know, whose stories we've told and you hear this quite often. Oh, he seemed so confident. He seemed so charming. He seemed exactly. so nice. He had such great bedside manner. It's like, yeah. it kind of yeah. makes you wonder if these guys were just not charming and not nice, <laughs> if they would have gotten away with it. But I, they, it's like their personalities overcame what they lacked in exactly. skill and morals. They overcame but in that, personality. <laughs> totally, Laura. I mean, that was one of the things about Paulo and even the reason I was attracted to him at first. His bedside manner was so gentle and soothing and he it was so touching to watch. I mean, you you really thought he cared about his patients. I really thought he cared about Hannah. And the stark reality is he didn't give a damn about any of them, you know. And to get back to Karolinska quickly, I think there was a lot of looking the other way and a lot of wanting to sweep the problem under the rug. And in that sense, I do think they are complicit. They were warned many times. They were warned by the whistleblowers early on. I wrote to the chancellor at the very beginning, not long after I found out everything myself and just said, I don't know exactly what's going on here, but you need to know that this man is not who you think he is. Your star surgeon is not the man you think he is. I got the same thing the whistleblowers did. Nothing. No answer. I think this man was so famous and was bringing them so many accolades and so much attention to Karolinska. There were whispers about him being in contention for the Nobel Prize in Medicine And there's so much money attached to this, and it's two things. It's money and it's prestige. And to blow either of those things up has devastating effects and devastating implications. And And have they changed anything? Have they learned any lessons? I get asked this a lot, and I actually don't know the answers even in the States, but Mm. so you might know. But are they doing anything differently now because of this? Oh, that's good to know. I do think so. I think it took a minute. I think there was a lot of resistance at the beginning. But once they decided to go ahead with it, I, I, they did take action. And there were, there were so many domino effects. I mean, people got fired. People resigned. But it's, it's interesting because, because I think the doctors who were involved maybe don't feel like Karolinska has learned. Oh. You know, yeah, there were a few heads that rolled, but the the institution sure. is still yeah. is still in place. Well look, I'm not there, right? I'm 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 over here in the US and I am I'm only seeing the little cursory things they have to do. Well and maybe now they'll actually check out their new doctors before they you know Oh God, I hope so. Speaking of checking out, so they obviously have tools that that you know patients don't and another common theme to to all of these stories really is how difficult it is for us as patients to check out our doctors. Yeah. This is something that's just a particular interest of mine because yeah. we are only, you know, a lot of them found him by Googling. And I you know, can't right? you can't fault them for that because no because Google it's terribly unreliable. These healthcare rating sites are unreliable. I mean, you know, Dunch had 4.5 mm-hmm. out of 5 stars on HealthGrade. Isn't that crazy? I mean, so they're completely misleading and unreliable, and yet they're all we've got. So I, I was wondering when there were a couple of lines about patients found him on Google, could you talk about that a little bit? Like how were these people finding him? Like how much was the internet involved in bringing him these patients. The internet played a massive role in in bringing Dr. Macarini his patients. Almost all of them found him by a simple Google search, which is terrifying in hindsight because he had, you know, his reputation as this quote-unquote super surgeon, the super surgeon, had grown and headlines picked up on that and you know, th- things spread like and wildfire. And what would they find the in internet. their Google search? Like, what would they would they find news articles about him? You know, are we as journalists like have some role in this because because journalists were writing mm. uncritical stories about him that would pop up in these Google searches? I mean, do all of us bear a little responsibility in that? That's an interesting question and a hard one. And I think I think yes, to some extent. Um, I don't quite know how you stop it. I mean, look, even when I did the story that I did on him, none of what we know now had come out yet. You know, at the time, the whistleblowers, even when it aired, the whistleblowers were just starting, you know, to put their heads together and working 
frantically to put everything together, but none of that information had been released to the public yet. So, you know, sh- short of somehow somebody knowing what the whistleblowers found out, I don't know how anyone was supposed to know that, you know, he had this He was hiding these dark secrets that had not been revealed yet. And you're saying because even his colleagues thought he was great. Yeah. I mean, he was still being vouched for by Karolinska, by the place that gives a Nobel Prize in medicine. They were still saying he might be a contender for a Nobel Prize in medicine. I mean, there just was no reason to question this man. There was no, you know, there were little hints like the thing that came up in Italy, but everything was immediately quelled or squashed. He had done a very good job of hiding anything negative, and there just was no reason to doubt him, unfortunately. I do think what journalists do, you know, if there's a headline and there's there's something online, it gets it gets picked up and repeated by other outlets who don't, and I've experienced this myself with false information that's been out there about me in the aftermath of this, and things get repeated, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> over and over and over again without anybody fact-checking. I mean, that alarms me. To a great deal. Uh, it's very eye-opening because uh, I've, you know, experienced this a little myself. But uh, first of all, I have to say I will defend journalists and journalism all day long, as I'm sure you will. Me but, too. But yep. I also think that every journalist should have journalism done to them, you know, to really— mm. Because it can be eye-opening how even tiny mistakes get repeated and amplified. They rely on other journalists, and and one of the part I actually loved in in when you were telling the story is how you saw the questions from the science journalist, and that was really startling to you because as a science journalist myself, I'm like yes, because one of the things that we argue for is <laughs> is there should be, as we've seen even with covering the coronavirus, there should be journalists with expertise in science covering yes. science stories. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly. And actually, when I th- when you think back to him, I think, you know, maybe that would have helped if you'd had. But then again, they were. They were covering him from these scientific journals, you know, Nature and all these other places. I don't know. It's a difficult problem to, to figure out. I, it makes me very nervous because I think back to these patients and they, it all comes back to vulnerability, really, right? They're, they're vulnerable and they're desperate. And that you do a Google search and see that this is the miracle man. This is the only man that that can fix this. He's the only man. That's what people were reading. This is the only man who can do this. He's doing something that nobody else can do. He's your only hope. And people, of course, people in that situation want to cling to a miracle, you know, and that's that's what happened. Dr. Death is sponsored by BetterHelp. Emotional health is tough, no matter what it is. Anxiety, depression, just feeling bad. You look the same. You can smile and talk and do all the same things you always do, but no one notices how much it hurts inside. So it's hard for them to help. BetterHelp is there for you. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, someone you can begin communicating with in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional therapy done securely online. Log in to your account anytime and message with your therapist or schedule video or phone sessions. It's more convenient and more affordable than traditional therapy, and BetterHelp is committed to finding you the right therapist. Switch anytime, easily, and at no charge. Visit BetterHelp.com doctor. That's better H-E-L-P. And join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com doctor. So I'd like to move to some more, a few more of the personal details about Paolo that maybe didn't make it in. And and I'm, but, but before we do that, I'm just wondering, I mean, there's so much about your experience with him. I'm, I'm wondering if you could pick out maybe like one thing that really haunts you from all of this trauma that you've been through. Mm, gosh, that's a tough one. There's sort of a two-part answer to that. The thing that incenses me to this day is my daughter. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing to do it to me, but to do this to a nine-year-old girl who just lost her father to cancer is unfathomable to me. And he's a father. He has children. And to sit in front of my daughter and tell her the same egregious lies that he was telling me, when you know she's a child, she's a vulnerable child, 
that makes me angry in a way I don't I just I don't even know how to describe. I mean, it's I'm my hands are up in the air as I'm talking to you right now because I'm it it makes my blood boil. How do you sit in front of a child and tell her about the school she's going to be going to in Barcelona and the life she's going to be living in Barcelona when you know the whole time everything you're saying is a lie? Do do you mind me asking, and you don't have to answer, but do you mind me asking how she is today, how she's doing today? She's great. She's she's about to go to college. She she is a, and obviously I'm biased because I'm her mom, but she is an incredibly intelligent, thoughtful, insightful young woman, and she has big dreams and great promise, and she doesn't talk about this a lot. We joke about it sometimes, and... The one thing she says to me all the time, she always says to me, Mom, you know, if I ever run into him, if I'm ever in an airport somewhere and I see him, I am walking up to him and I am going to slap him across the face. (laughs) I don't care where I am or when this happens. I Yeah, right. You have to laugh. I have to laugh because she said this so many times and sometimes I will laugh. And she just looks at me and she's like, Mom, I'm not joking. It's on. And then her other line, which she loves to tell her friends, which kind of makes me cringe, but I can't really argue with her, but I guess it's her gallows humor way of dealing with this is <laughs> she's like, my mom dated a serial killer. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> that sounds awful. <laughs> so how I'm, I'm wondering how if, if you since since this happened to you, if you have any sense of how I, I'm always interested in origin stories a little bit, you know, and how early do you think his deception started? Like, I mean, we know where it started with you, but I'm wondering, like, in mm-hmm. general, like, with his, was he lying, like, all along in his, you know, with his surgical career? Was he lying all along to women? I mean, how far does this go back? My hunch is that this is something that started very early. I don't really have any direct evidence of that. And it's funny, I just was talking to my mother about this yesterday because we were, we were actually talking about the podcast, and she remembered that he had talked about his father, I don't know, fighting against the Nazis or something and doing all this crazy stuff. And she said, do you think any of that was real? And I said, probably not. And how many other women, like, were there? I mean, you couldn't Uh, have been the only one. Like, how many women did Paolo con? Any idea? um, I'm just trying to count here. At the same time as me, there were at least three other women in his life. There was the wife that he told me he had divorced, who in reality he never actually divorced. They were separated, and they had been separated for many years, and she's the mother of his children. So, But then there's the woman in the home in Barcelona. Um, there's another woman who reached out to me who I promised that I would keep her identity confident, and I always have. Um, but she had a thing with him right in the middle of mine. And there are, there are other women that, you know, so that's, that's four of us right there, and there are others that I suspect, and I've heard, you know, through the grapevine that he had things going going on with, and somebody told me, um, a male colleague of his, that he liked to joke about having a woman in every port in the world. So, unfortunately, I think there are a lot. So, how far was he going to—this is another question I had—how far was he going to carry this wedding <laughs> thing. I mean, because right? at some point, right? it, it had to, it had, he had to pull the plug on it in some way, but it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, do you think he ever intended to actually marry you or how is he going to get out of this? So this is the money question, right? Because clearly when you, you plan the wedding of the century, it's, and none of it is real, it's going to implode at some point, right? So my theory is that there wasn't a plan. I don't think these people have a plan. I think he was, they get so caught up in their own web of lies that they're just, they're just going from one lie to the next because they have a history of getting away with things and they always have gotten away with things. I mean, look at Paolo at, with, he's doing surgeries around the world and he, and Karolinska and everything. They somehow always wiggle out of it. They somehow always manage to blame somebody else and get so out of it. you think he just, he didn't really know what his end game was. He just thought he was going to be okay. I don't think he did. I I don't think I think he was he was sort of going one step at a time. I in hindsight, I think towards the end he was panicking. When I look back and I think back to the sort of 3 months or so leading up to when I found everything out, we were fighting a lot. 
He had changed, and I attributed it at the time to everything that was going on in Sweden. But I think it was also mounting tension about how the hell am I going to get out of this and what am I going to do? Because he, you know, he knew I quit my job. He knew the wedding was coming up, and this door was kind of closing in on him. And I think he was panicking a bit. And you were spending a lot of your own money in this as well. I mean, did you recoup some of the money that you had spent on this? I did spend quite a bit of money. He had always been very, very generous financially, and not just with me, with my friends and my family. I mean, you know, he'd, he'd take big groups of people out to these very elaborate dinners and pay for everything. He was always taking me to Michelin star restaurants ordering the most expensive wine. And I mean, the bills were astronomical and always shocking to me. But when it came to the wedding, because he was planning everything, supposedly, in Europe, and there were certain things he wanted me to take care of, um, which was my dress, basically, and the invitation. So he told me that, go ahead and pay for those things and I'll pay you back. And then he kept adding all these events and all these things that I needed you know, red carpet dresses for. So between the dresses, it was the the dresses, the invitations, the buying plane tickets um, for people in the wedding party and for myself and my daughter that to travel to Europe, things like that. Just a lot of the little miscellaneous wedding wedding stuff. It added up to well over $50,000. Oh, my gosh. So did you ever get any money back from him from what you had spent? Yeah, well, so finally I said, if you can't give me any cash, give me a credit card so that I can at least pay for some things on credit card. And he gave me a credit card number because I kept saying I need money to send my daughter to camp. You know, she goes to the summer camp every summer. I need to buy her things, I, you know. And so he gave me this credit card. I mean, the big things that I actually really needed to pay, my mortgage, the private investigator. Obviously, I can't pay the private investigator on his credit card. Um, so one night, we sort of turned it into a, a fun little girls' party. You know, I, I poured some wine. I had a couple girls on the phone also on wine and on speaker. And I got on Amazon, and I literally was looking around my apartment going, okay, what do I need? Uh, I need toilet paper. This is pre-pandemic, mind you, when nobody did this. I ordered 40 rolls of toilet paper, you know, 20 rolls of paper towels. I need cleaning supplies. I need this. I need that. I kind of ordered everything I needed for the house (laughs) and some things for my daughter, a few things for myself that were kind of fuck you items, quite frankly, um, including the blonde wig that I would end up wearing when I went to his house in Barcelona. And so what was the total bill? It was... It, it wasn't crazy. I didn't I didn't go crazy. It was less than $1,000. It was just kind of a fun, if you can call it that at the moment, way for me to kind of stick it to him a little bit. I wonder sometimes why certain companies choose their names. Is there a clever backstory? Does the name evoke a feeling or sentiment? Or is it just a name, something trendy and internet random? For instance, Parachute. Founded in 2014 to provide luxurious, high-quality sheets direct to consumers at modest prices. They sourced the best materials and vetted the most experienced manufacturers to bring high-end European hotel luxury to average American bedrooms. So why parachute? I don't actually know. But what is a parachute? It's fabric that brings you home. And that's pretty good. Fabric that brings you home. Like my linen duvet cover, crafted in Portugal from the finest European flax and garment washed for a cool, soft, lived-in feel from the very first night. They have so much for the home. Bedding, bath, decor, baby items, robes, and loungewear, all made of fabric that brings you home. See what they have for you. Visit ParachuteHome.com slash doctor for free shipping and returns on Parachute's very comfortable home essentials. That's ParachuteHome.com slash doctor for free shipping and returns on soft sheets, fluffy towels, and all things comfy. So if he was sitting in front of you right now and he would answer anything honestly, what questions would you have for him if you could get honest answers. The only question I have for that man is why. Why did you do this to me, to my family, to my friends, to my daughter? Why do you do this to anybody? Why did you do this to your patients? And any idea what the answer to that question might be? Complete denial. 
I think this man is incapable of telling the truth and incapable of understanding the sick gravity of, of and implications of his lies. I don't, I just don't know. I, I, I cannot, I, you know, I can't get in the man's head. I don't, I don't know. So how do you get, given that you probably will never be able to have that conversation, how do you and the other women who have been through this get closure? Because you will not be able to confront them. And even if you were, I mean, let's be honest, they're, they're not going to come out and have genuine remorse, probably. Of course not. They have no remorse. So how do you reach a point where you're okay, maybe not with what happened, but with where you are today? What I tell women all the time now is don't drive yourself crazy trying to figure out a crazy person. We can't understand them. We, we, their brains are not wired the same way our brains are wired. Something's wrong. Something's clearly very, very wrong. I realized that a long time ago. And what I tell women all the time now is to try and take yourself away from that and away from, from the person because you'll get mired in a, in a hole you're never going to get out of. You, you will never get the answers. And so the way to heal is to focus on yourself and to realize that you, yes, you got conned. No, you are not stupid. And this can happen to anyone. These guys are incredibly manipulative, incredibly adept at what they do. There's brainwashing. There's gaslighting. I'm just wondering if you think that you, I mean, right now you're sort of president of the club that no woman wants to be in. (laughs) Do you think you will ever reach a point where he's not an unwelcome guest in your mind? When I go back and I think about things and I, I talk about things in the moment, I get very angry and I can get upset, but I sort of almost feel nothing for him now. He's kind of, it's kind of blank. I just, I want justice. I want justice for his patients. And that's why I want to go to the courtroom if I can and, and mm-hmm. look him eye to eye in that courtroom. But yeah, I'm just kind of blank. I just, okay. because also the reality, Laura, is the, the man that I thought I was in love with literally doesn't exist. The man I thought Dr. Paolo Maccarini was never was. Well, speaking of things that never was, I have one last question that that I was also wondering of a completely different nature. But when when you were describing this huge celebrity filled wedding that you were supposedly going to have, mm-hmm. of all that guest list, who were you most looking forward to to meeting? Like like what what you know in your fantasy wedding guest, which he was in, in the fantasy wedding that he was portraying for you, um, who, when it all I, fell apart, who were you most sad? You're like, oh, man, <laughs> now I'm not going to see who. I don't know if I ever thought of it exactly that way. Some of my friends have been like, oh, I didn't get to meet this person or that person. The person that I actually, of all the people that he claimed were coming to this wedding, the person that I really was excited to meet was Elton John. I've always been a fan of Elton John, so much so. His song, Benny and the Jets, my nickname is Benny. My family calls me Ben. My whole family calls me Benny. And the very first license plate I had on on a car when I was a teenager in Michigan said Benny and the Jets. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I just was sad that I didn't get to meet Elton John. I didn't really care about anybody else. <laughs> but what a stroke of luck that he was actually in Rome, like, that day. I know, I know. I, yeah, and that was one of the things that really tripped me up because that was one of the few things I I did check. I mean, he, he had insisted that I not, you know, I wasn't supposed to ask any questions, but I did a tiny bit of poking around. I mean, when he told me that Elton John was going to be singing for me at this event on Friday night, um. I did look into, you know, Elton John's schedule and everything, and he actually was in Rome that weekend of our wedding and was going to be there the whole weekend and performing at the place where Paolo said this event was taking place. So, How close then did you get to Elton John that night? Oh, when I went to see him? Um, we tried to get as close to the front as we could, and we weren't very far back, I think maybe 10 rows or something, and I was sort of joking with Lee, you know, that I wanted to rush the stage and say, hey, by the way... You know, I'm the one you're supposed to be singing to at the wedding. But of course, you know. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. <laughs> I, I do love the way, you know, I have to say, I mean, I know we're out of time, but I, I do love the way that you, you know, when you got there putting on the dress and, and 
you know, it's just like you had been through so much, and I can't imagine the devastation. And you were just like, you know what? I'm just going to own this. And you went there and you put on the dress. And I, I have to say I really admired that. Thank you. I, and actually, I, I appreciate that because it was, it was me reclaiming myself. It was me being defiant and determined. And, you know, in the face of all of this devastation and this overwhelming desire to, to fall apart and hide under the bed. Well, that's, that's, how, I, that's how I took it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's what that red dress was. That was me saying, mm-mm, you're not doing this to me. Well, Benita, thank you for talking with me about this. Yeah, thank you for doing it. I, I do think shame keeps women from, from speaking up about this, and I, I admire your courage in, in going forward and putting yourself out there and trying to prevent it from happening. I, thank you. I, can, I think that's the one thing. If there's one other thing I can do aside from expose him, it's to help women know that they should not be shamed into silence. You know, it's this happens. You because, fall in you know, love. A man that would do this, I mean, we've seen it here, but a man that would do this to a woman in that context will do it professionally as well. I mean, and it's not just surgeons, although that's a little more terrifying, but but a man who would who would con a woman this way you know, we'll con someone in their professional life. We'll con it, you know, someone in, I mean, there's not, it's not a boundary for them to be exactly. deceptive. And so they will be deceptive exactly. in in other realms exactly. as well. Yeah, which is exactly why I made that decision to do the story in Vanity Fair at the beginning, because I thought if he's, if he's lying to me in this extreme manner, there is no way, there's just no way he's not lying in the medical professional arena. And you were right. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, yes. (laughs) Yeah. Unfortunately, yes. For his patients, unfortunately, yes. I wish, I wish that were not the case. I wish, I wish it had just been me, but it, it, it wasn't. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. I really, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. This is a special interview episode of Dr. Death, Miracle Man. I'm your host, Laura Beal. Producer is Nika Singh, who also reported this story. Additional reporting by Julia Alanya. Fact-checking by Jacqueline Coletti. Production assistance from Fiona Pistana. Additional production assistance from Simran Singh, Chris Siegel, Guglielmo Mattioli, and Melissa Duenas. Special thanks to Lindsey Graham. Audio engineer is Marcelino Villalpando. Managing producer is Lata Pandya. Music supervisor is Scott Velasquez. Sound design by Salt. Our executive producers are George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Jen Sargent for Wondery. 